Technical writing used to involve explaining standalone programs for consumers and other end users of those applications. Nowadays, a lot of computing code is released in the form of APIs, application programming interfaces, which are written by developers for other programmers, not for the end user. This creates a whole new class of duties and concerns for tech writers. Tom Johnson has done both of these kinds of technical writing and is really good at explaining how programmers and writers collaborate to document APIs. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. We talk with professionals who work across the span of content strategy, from small businesses to big enterprises, from content design to content marketing, from solo consultancies to huge agencies. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 88 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Tom Johnson. Tom is a um, senior technical writer at Amazon. He also writes, uh, he's a prolific blogger at I'd Rather Be Writing. And uh, he also teaches a, a course, offers an online course on API documentation. And that's what we're going to talk about today is APIs. And, but, but first, welcome, Tom. And uh, if you'd like to tell the folks anything more about yourself, please. Uh, thanks, Larry. I'm excited to be on your podcast. Uh, I'm based in California in Santa Clara. been here about seven years, but I'm a West Coast person. Um, I, I do love to write. I consider myself foremost kind of a, a writer who steered his career into technical writing and then into API documentation. Uh, but at the heart of what I do, even though I love working with tools and learning about different technologies, I do love writing content. Um, I know a lot of people kind of downplay the, the, the writing aspect, but uh, creating something uh, from scratch, you know, that really like unravels something complex in a really clear way is generally fulfilling. And I, and I like doing that. Yeah, I think you exemplify the, this broad profession of content strategy and that most of us come from uh, a writing background, but things are getting way more technical by the day. And um, how did you, so how you, because you started as like you were a teacher and, and did sort of conventional writing kinds of things. How did you end up in the technical world? Well, I did try teaching composition for at, at like university level for a while realized that that wasn't really going anywhere uh, you kind of need a phd to go anywhere in the academia and you know the job market was terrible for that um, while i was teaching i happened to also be creating interactive websites for my students and one of my colleagues said hey tom you would be a perfect technical writer this is a colleague who had done technical writing but i'd resisted it for a long time because it just looked so boring you know so like such a such a sellout right um to, to to just sort of abandon this this passion of more of a creative writing literature sort of career and do technical writing but uh when I finally made the jump due to just financial circumstances, right, I, I realized that it's actually quite, quite engaging. You know, the whole tech industry is moving so fast, new stuff is coming out every week. Um, and you're right in the middle of that and you're creating content that people want. You're not trying to sell them something. You're trying to help them. Uh, I just found it to be a great fit. And, and, you know, even if you're not, in an academic environment where you're where you're doing research, you you are constantly learning. You're learning technical things, um, uh, and that is sort of fulfilling as well. Anyway, um, I worked in traditional tech writing for a number of years, and there was a layoff at a company in Utah that forced me to kind of rethink my career uh, directions, and I headed out to California and in the Bay Area most of the documentation jobs are in API documentation. So it was sort of the natural, natural destination to kind of um, transition into the API doc world. Hey, because so many of our listeners are not as far along as you in the technical journey, let's back up a little bit and talk about what an API is and, um, and sort of the transition also. There's two things in there I want to get to. Is one is, as I understand it, technical writing and technical communication has evolved from this sort of describing how a program works to being much more involved 
in, involved in a different way. So I'd, I'd love to get to that, but also just what an API is and how it works and, and its role in modern um, content and publishing. Sure. Um, I think when most people talk about API documentation, they're generally talking about developer documentation. About 80% of the time when you're writing documentation for developers who are building apps or building services, um, it involves an API of some kind that may, may not be the main part of the documentation, but it's kind of in there. Um, and an API stands for application programming interface. It's how companies make their services kind of available for others to build with. Um, for example, this is a simple example I give in my course. Let's say you, you have a bunch of weather information, your meteorological uh, service of some kind. You want to allow people to build weather apps. So you provide an API so that people can call and get your weather information and pull it into their apps. That's kind of the most basic example. Another great example is, is like when you, when you search for airlines uh, and you want to get flights, right? You go to services like Kayak or others. Those, those sites are pulling in information from other databases and sources in order to kind of present them to you. Um, but all the time, developers work with APIs to, to build things. And really, an API kind of abstracts the complexity of a task <clears throat> behind the scenes. You don't want to... When developers are building something, you want to make it easy for them. So you give them some simple way to do a task. And that simple way is usually the API. They put in some inputs and they get back a response or some outputs. And what goes on behind the scenes, you know, is often not really important for them to know. They just need to know how they get those outputs and what's required of them. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a high level intro to like what API documentation is. Right, and that's and I think um, I'm trying to think of an analogous things that happen because it, that's happening all over the place now, and a huge amount of what we're doing. But I think a lot of con a lot of content strategists operate like in more of an old style monolithic CMS, where like everything happens within this one ecosystem. Have you had to go from that sort of monolithic? situation to the the api world where there's this sort of like where everything happens in one kind of vertical container to this the world of apis is about these little microservices that are connected with apis um did, how i guess did you have to make any conceptual or leaps in your mind um well when i was working in in more traditional documentation for mainstream end users um yeah, APIs never really factored into that. You had a solution. What it was built with didn't really matter because you were writing for non-developers or I was writing for non-developers. And one of my first jobs when I came out to the Bay Area was for um, this company company that had as their core product, like kind of a little widget that other people would integrate into their their website solution. Like it was one sliver of something. And that is kind of a more difficult model when you think that I'm just documenting a piece of a larger solution and this piece alone doesn't do anything. It's like how you connect it in with some other pieces that work in harmony for some, some end goal that can be kind of challenging. I like to see things end to end, you know, you want to, you want to build something and have it run and, you know, do something uh, interesting. But a lot of times the services that you're documenting are just like very, very uh, uh, singular in what they do. And it's, it's not intended to be like an end solution in and of itself. I guess that you're getting it kind of why I wanted to talk to you on the, on the, on the podcast, that conceptual stitch. And I guess that's why I was talking about the monoliths versus the, the microservices. It's this stitching together that's happening. That's like the new part of this that, that you have. And well, I guess, let me ask you how at a kind of a practical level that's dealt with. Are there standards about how one writes an API and shares, you know, how, the, how you share information and then how you write the APIs to access it? Or how, how do you, how do you make it all work? Yeah, let, let me give an example kind of of something I currently work with. Uh, when people build Fire TV apps, um, uh, they'll often work with some some APIs around like Alexa. Uh, the, the, oh, I'm going to set off all my machines if I <laughs> say that word. Um, the, the, so, so the main job in describing the API 
in the main, sorry, the main task in, in the documentation is really to describe what comes back from the API and the developer has to kind of figure out wh how they're going to incorporate that into their app. You, you usually don't have to say, okay, now that you get back this block of JSON or whatever, uh, you don't explain how somebody then handles it to build their app. Like that's sort of dependent on the language they're using, the framework, the, the sort of uh, way they're wanting to use it, um, which is another aspect of, of the API doc world. It's more of like a, like a, a kitchen of ingredients where you say you can do this, 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 uh, but you don't usually have a very prescriptive sequence of how you must use them. Um, you, you can use the different APIs to accomplish tasks in different ways. It's much more flexible. Whereas if you're writing documentation for some visual application that has a defined workflow, you might have uh, more, more specific kind of tasks. Like you do step one, then you always do step two, then step three. Anyway, so the API, API world is more open. Um, you, you usually don't go through all, all the ways that you could um, make use of the APIs. Um, in fact, a lot of API designers emphasize that uh, you should design your API in a way that you could be surprised by how people use it, like allow for some creativity and flexibility in the way that it's used um, that might allow for more robust application of it. Well, that's so interesting because that's um, so one of the the big concepts I think that's a, that's at work in content strategy practice in general is just constantly disarticulating content from its presentation, and a lot of what you were just talking about right there is completely germane to that. And and the reason I mentioned that is that when you think about like the way you used to do like to display weather information on your website, you would have just gone out and sent a reporter to get the, or however you did it and would publish that the way that you do it. Whereas nowadays it's like you, you have like, I love the way you said that you have some curiosity about the weather and you have a, and you're, you know, that your audience wants it. And there's some other, there's a bunch of services out there that provide weather information. And so the API is the thing that lets you go like, okay, this service has the right weather information that I want that serves my customers needs. And then it's just a technical detail of figuring out how to implement an API that does that. Is that a one way of looking at that or? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, APIs usually return a lot of different types of information um, and, and some may be more relevant to users than others. Coming back to the weather example, um, let's say that I'm building an app and all I want to know is like the wind speed. Let's say I'm trying to figure out like correlation between wind and wildfire or something, right? So uh, that may be the only thing that's important to me. Now, the API, API designer has to figure out how they, uh, how they create res uh, responses that will have the right amount of information for the user. If you just pack in dozens and dozens of uh, uh, fields that are returned, that's not going to be a great experience. It's going to be slow. It's going to be uh, hard to iterate through to find the field you want. So the API designers have to figure out like the right amount of content that's going to match with what most developers are trying to do. You know, so there's, it's not as if you can be completely hands off and say, well, I don't know what they're going to do with it. I mean, you, you do kind of have to have an idea um, so that, so that it's usable. Interesting. So you're operating in a, a common domain and then everybody kind of handles the details, how both on the supply side and the demand side of these, um, this functionality, you, you, you kind of tailor it to your, what you're good at or what your customers need. It sounds like it's really, I'm, it's fascinating conceptually, I got to say. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I did want to say just a, a little point about design. Um, it's very common when you're a tech writer creating documentation for a traditional application uh, that you would have a lot of feedback about the design, right? Because you're using it. You can say things like, oh, this button doesn't make any sense. And this is such a wonky interface. And, you know, or, or maybe it's a physical product like, oh, this is really awkward. When you get a code solution, it can be difficult to assess it because, you know, usually the tech writers aren't engineers you don't have a background in architectural design and engineering so a lot of times we're just struggling to keep up and understand what's going on 
But later, when you see how people implement it, you can realize that, hey, there's a lot of usability aspects here. Like this was really hard for people to implement or this didn't have the information people actually wanted or they had to do some crazy stuff to authenticate it or you know, people are constantly messing up on the parameters. And all that comes back to um, like usability. And, and that's a huge field that is sort of ripe for tech writers to uh, become more familiar with. Like, how do you, how do you um, Im improve that? Because the ease of use is actually the number one thing that people want uh, from APIs, the, con the people who consume them, developers who consume them. Um, and the second thing they want is clear and accurate documentation. So, which is where you come in. Um, and, and, and you're doing that kind of collaboratively, right? You work very closely with the, de the developers as you develop these, right? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, especially if it's a very technical topic, you, you may be reliant on the engineers for code samples. Um, you know, some power tech writers might be creating their own code samples. That's much less common. It depends on the sort of product and what kind of depth these code samples are. But um, you would definitely want to get code samples from the developers and you'd want to be able to run them yourself, to make sure they work as advertised so that you can describe them. Uh, but, but you are kind of very reliant on engineering input, review, feedback. You do work collaboratively. Often API documentation has a reference material that's auto-generated from the source. Um, and that is oftentimes created by the engineers and kind of edited by the tech writers. Um, so yeah, you, you work hand in hand. A lot of times you'll have a sample app that they create or some other extensive code example. And you would have to sort of, you document that and you show how it kind of fits in with the documentation you're describing, you're, you're, you're providing. You can say, hey, here's an example of this in the, in the sample app or make other references. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so, as you talk about that, I'm realizing that both you individually, I'm assuming, and your whole field have made this adaptation over the last 10 or years or whatever it has been from writing most of the tech writing it used to do. I mean, back in the day, you think of like the manual about to help end users use the software, whereas now your audience is more the developers who are, you know, the API documentation is for this entirely different audience. Was that a gradual shift or did you just all of a sudden wake up one day and you're writing for developers rather than for end users? Uh, it was pretty much a, a overnight thing when I first started my first API doc job and I realized all my developers are pretty much JavaScript engineers. Uh, is it, it is a mindset shift, a shift in perspective. Um, Occasionally, there are product managers who read the docs because they're trying to figure out if it's like, you know, going to be something they want. But by and large, you are writing for developers, and that does change things uh, considerably. Um, whereas with with a non technical user, you might be able to kind of put yourself in their shoes and be like, well, I don't know what this term would mean, and let me define that. Well, with the developer, uh, it can be really tough. Like, you sort of assume that they're familiar with a certain programming language. Um, for example, a lot of the, the Amazon stuff in my space relies on Android, uh, people knowing Android, right? So because um, Amazon Fire TV is just like a clone of, of the Android operating system. So we assume that people are familiar with a lot of things in Android, and you don't want to re-explain something that's already explained in the Android documentation. But the Android documentation itself is vast. I mean, it's really... I mean, there's a lot of different corners of it. Um, and do you just assume that, oh yeah, my users are Android pros, you know, that they know everything? Or do you assume that they're kind of like winging it in that realm? It's tough to gauge how much they need to know. And of course the, the product teams who are designing the APIs often overestimate the technical abilities of their audience. And they just think, oh yes, of course they're gonna know this. If they're an Android engineer, they will know that and this. And then later you often find out that no, you know, the developers actually struggled with, with that or they, they you know, uh, had a tough time implementing that. It's like, well, why? Probably because they weren't as familiar with it as, as you assume. On the other hand, in other cases, uh, if somebody is an advanced user, they can kind of uh, just 
glance at the reference docs and not even need tutorials or other information and just kind of go to town on building their application. Maybe that's all they want. They don't really want to read through details and pages and pages of, you know, fluffy copy in order to get the nuggets of information that they need about maybe parameter types or, you know, responses. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so, are you sort of the, the, the mediator, the moderator, and the, because there's these varying levels of ability and, and, and awareness and sophistication and varying needs and, and all this stuff, are you sort of the linchpin in all that, like figuring out like what you need mm -hmm. from people and... No, no. Uh, I mean, sure, in a way you're kind of the interface, but not really. Uh, usually in, in groups that are building solutions for third parties, there's a role that is uh, like a field engineer or an evangelist or, or some kind of person, like a technical engineer and engineering type of person who interfaces with the partners to kind of help them build the solutions, answer questions, interface with them. Um, maybe they're called developer advocates and other places, um, developer evangelists. So that person is usually the interface with uh, the partners. Of course, it depends on your industry and domain and so forth. But uh, by and large, who's ever interfacing with that developer can help you understand like the limits of, of what that developer's understanding is around the concepts. Um, and so we sync heavily with our field engineers. We're constantly kind of getting feedback from them. Uh, they will say things like, hey, uh, you know, the, the developers are really stuck here. You know, they've found this, this problematic and we'll focus on that. Um, uh, yeah, mo most organizations that, that do have solutions like this where you're trying to get others to build with your APIs will have this role and that's who you want to sync with. Got it. And that's so, that's an interesting, um, the, just that, you know, I think people like who work on product stuff, that's sort of like the product manager would have that role, that sort of synchronizing, coordinating central role. I guess, but maybe can you speak more broadly just to working with engineers, I guess, because that's your ultimate audience and that's who you're most closely <clears throat> connected with. Um, how closely are, are you... Are you actually sitting down side? Well, not today in COVID era, but uh, something like sitting down next to each other and working together, or is there? What's the work process like? Oh, uh, I'm sure it varies highly from company to company. Uh, I think ideally you want to embed yourself within the engineering agile teams. You know, engineers follow a very a lot of them follow great methodologies, um, usually Agile Scrum or Kanban, but they track everything with tickets. You know, they're very metho methodical in their approach. Uh, they have sprint retrospectives and demos and other kind of like daily standups. And in my experience, if you can plug into those, you have a great time. Like, uh, well, maybe not a great time. I'm saying <laughs> your experience... And providing the documentation goes much better. You build rapport. They know who you are. You're kind of in the, in the know. Uh, so if you can embed with engineers and kind of just like go in their same rhythm, that works well. However, I think a lot of people are supporting so many different teams and you sort of bounce from project to project. And it takes developers a long time just to build a small feature. So you probably are wasting your time if you're like attending every meeting through the life of the project, right? So you're ca usually called in when the development team has kind of reached a point where they're getting near a release. And then you sort of have to, uh, you know, uh, work heads down to, to write all the documentation. But um, most developers that I work with, they're very open. They love to, well, they don't love to review docs, but they they definitely will. They see the value of documentation and, and they're very... Um, they're very open to being honest and transparent in the documentation. If you have known limitations, uh, issues, those are usually welcome, welcomely at, or they're, they're added in a welcome way in the documentation. Whereas other times, like if you have more of a product manager, marketing manager, they may not want you to sort of um, uh, be transparent about all the warts in an application, but a developer's building. So if there are certain limitations, they have to know, otherwise it's just gonna come back to that engineering team as tickets that they have to solve and resolve and deal with. So I, I love that aspect. 
I love being able to be completely honest about like how something works or doesn't work. And, uh, and engineers are usually great colleagues in that endeavor. Interesting. Yeah. I, I love that, that relationship. And it sounds like there's a lot of sort of people and process craft in there about knowing, like you said, you don't want to go to every stand up or every, you just kind of knowing when to stick your head in. Is that sort of a, an instinct that you develop over time or? Uh, no, I mean, um, I've actually been writing a series of posts about like, what is our, our method? And um, I'll point you to some links later, but I think it does take a lot of effort. It depends, again, like your organization. But if you are sort of uh, uh, providing docs for 20 different teams, you have to constantly be on the lookout for what's coming down the radar, like who's working on what, what are the release timelines what what's the organization's strategic goal goals uh for the year what products are are planned and then sort of reach out to these teams and find out the scope of it and sort of uh what's expected are they writing the docs are they not writing the docs sometimes teams you know uh, actually provide their own documentation um so y- you do have to you do have to like project manage, uh, as I think is common in many places. But um, <clears throat> yeah, a, a lot of times, you know, this is n- nothing new to tech writers, but product teams will wait until the product is almost done before they reach out to tech writers for help, right? And by that time, you're like, well, I've already got, you know, this other project I'm working on, I can't just drop everything and start working on it. And I, I definitely try to avoid those scenarios uh, by planning and just kind of keeping aware of what's going on right and that's it sounds like you said is 20 an exaggeration or are you actually working on that many different projects at one time uh, uh, well a lot of things are dormant for many years and then they they surface so uh like yeah and i've been it in my current role almost five years so like i've seen projects come and go uh, teams sort of um, abandon them after release, but it's still kind of an active project. And so like you kind of own it and, but maybe there's nothing going on there. So you could have a lot of different things going on, or you could have periods of, of downtime even, uh, that's kind of rare, but, um, I think it is hard for people to estimate how much like bandwidth a tech writer has or doesn't have, because very few people kind of understand the role of the tech writer writer amazingly enough they don't know if like they have too many tech writers or too few especially in in organizations that only have like one tech writer they don't even have anything to compare against and in surveys that i've done about 30 percent of writers in api docs are lone writers Um, this can be very very difficult for the writer because like you know um just people don't understand the role. They don't understand how to work with you when they pull you in. If you've got too much, what, what expectations are around, around you, you have to sort of teach others, Um, you know, especially even in the review process, you have to pull them along, tell them uh, what you expect and, and uh, different methods work better than others. So, you're just reminding me, I have several friends in that exact situation where they're the lone technical documentation person in like an, you know, an insurance company or someplace. And people are like, we, well, we knew we need you, but, uh, you know, there's, that's, that's a whole other episode, I think, <laughs> to, that you like to, to talk about that. Well, hey, Tom, we're, we're coming up close to time. I always like to give my guests an opportunity. Is there anything last, anything that's come up in this conversation or that's just on your mind uh, about technical uh, communication or, or anything that you want to uh, share with the folks before? Before we wrap up um you know i i i let's see what, what is on my mind i find that i'm personally more engaged in my career uh if i'm writing about it i know that a lot of people uh love to write who are who who have a tech writing career maybe they started out you know doing creative writing or what but uh, if there's one secret, I think, that has helped kind of keep my interest in this career, it is um, having a blog. Um, I was just writing a post today, or, or actually this is, will be another article in my API doc course on documentation maintenance. You know, like we're always focused on the new stuff and we neglect things that, have, that are existing, that are just kind of in our, in our documentation portal. Um, 
And it's amazing how like things begin to decay from the moment you publish something, it's, it's already on its path to like becoming outdated. And how do you like reverse that trend? Just writing about it and thinking through it has kind of like given me more energy to attack this problem. And I love trying new things. I love to explore new ideas. A lot of times it doesn't work out or like, you know, I try just the other week, I was like, huh, yeah, I'm going to go sit outside all day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work in a park. Um, this is a different thing I was trying to deal with, sort of the, the work from home structure and trying to get out of this uh, mindset where home and work just sort of blend together in, in confusing ways. And, and it's, it didn't really work, but I had a modification that did kind of work uh, at the end. But even so, the, the whole act of trying something new, writing about it, was a lot of fun. And I personally find that the most enjoyable part of, of uh, being a tech writer. And I'd encourage other people who are thinking about, hey, um, I wouldn't mind having a space to reflect and kind of publish my thoughts on, on my career. Uh, start a blog. Um, so many doors have been opened in my career because of it. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing. Um, a lot of times I'll go into – if if I'm uh, changing jobs or something, I'll go into an interview and like the person has already read my blog and they're sort of already won over to me by the time I even meet them. Um, and I, I think that's, that's kind of comforting. I, I have an MFA from Columbia in literary nonfiction. And a lot of times I look back and think, man, I was headed in such a different direction when I started my career and now I'm doing tech writing. But it was helpful having that writing background because it, it did sort of help me be more successful in my tech writing role. That's great. And anyway, I think that so could apply just some random thoughts. <clears throat> no, that could, what you just said could apply to any professional, but you can understand a writer wanting to take a break from writing when they go home, but like, no, you can do like Tom does and just keep writing. <laughs> well, it, it's a different, it's a different mode. Okay. If, if you're writing documentation, you're, you're in an explanatory mode. You're trying to explain how something works. A lot of times my favorite posts on the blog are in the discovery mode or reflection mode. You know, you start out, you don't know exactly where you're going. You, you're, you've got something in your mind you're trying to figure out. And that's sort of the impetus to writing. And that mode switch makes a huge difference, right? I, I get bored if I'm just documenting stuff I already know. That's sort of a chore, right? I think part of the fun of technical documentation, honestly, is in that space where you don't know how something works and you're trying to figure it out. And then when you finally crack that code and you're like, you've unlocked its secret and you're like, oh my gosh, I understand how this thing works. I got it to build. Like I just needed to do this and that. It's kind of a rush. So, um, you know, they, they have some similarities, but basically in the evening, if you can flip that switch and be like, oh, what am I thinking about? What is something that I'm curious to reflect on? It, it, it makes writing, at least for me, more refreshing. And it's more of like a fun time rather than a, than a professional activity. I, th I think the way you just articulated that may help some people get past writer's block around that. Yeah, you know, that difference between reflection and explanation. And I love that. Well, hey, one last thing, Tom, what's the best way for folks to stay in touch with you to follow you online? Or uh, how do you like to connect with people? Well, um, my, my site is I'd rather be writing.com. And there are links to my API dot course there. Um, I am on Twitter as well at Tom Johnson. And I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, so you can engage with me in any of those ways. You can also reach out to me. I have a contact uh, button on my site for email. If you have like a burning question, feel free to reach out. Great. Well, thanks so much, Tom. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Larry. This has been fun. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.